All right. Last week, um, we began getting into a new book of the Bible. Actually, the book that follows John. John was a great study. We enjoyed it. And last week, we, we started to look at introductory material about the Acts of the Apostles, the book that follows the Gospel of John, as we begin to see the Apostles working, uh, following the instruction of the Lord Jesus, working through the power of the Holy Spirit, and beginning to get this church going that Jesus had promised that He would build. And so, today we'll begin actually studying word by word, beginning in chapter 1 and verse 1 of the Acts of the Apostles. And the first two verses we'll look at as we get a little bit of introduction in verses 1 and 2. It goes like this, chapter 1, verse 1, The former treatise... Have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which He was taken up, after that He, through the Holy Ghost, had given commandments unto the apostles whom He had chosen. Amen. So, verses 1 and 2, we see, are an introduction. The introduction of the author, Luke. He introduces this thing and he says, The former treatise... Have I made, O Theophilus? Now, he's speaking to a man by the name of Theophilus. This is the same name that you find in the Gospel of Luke. He addressed that Gospel to a man named Theophilus in chapter 1 and verse 3. That's the author Luke. Um, Now, Theophilus is an interesting word. Uh, If you know anything about the roots of words, Theos or Theos or a theist or a theist, Theos is God. And Theophilus, Philos is the word like phileo, which is to love. And so this is, this is being written to someone that is a God lover, someone that loves God. That's to whom he wrote the Gospel of Luke, and that's to whom he writes this book here. I hope that would apply to you and to me. And I know in our natural man we did not love God, but once the love of God had reached down unto us and the grace of God was offered to us and through hearing the Word of God we have turned to God and placed our faith in His Son Jesus Christ and we're born of God, now we're lovers of God. Now we seek God. Now we love the things of God. Now we have a desire for the sincere milk of the Word. And you can usually tell someone that's saved from someone that's not saved because unsaved people have no interest in this book. I had no interest in this book before I was saved. I don't know if you did. But now, being a kind of Theophilus ourselves, being lovers of God, we love the Word of God and we, we want to read this treatise. We want to learn about the things that Jesus uh, began to do and teach. I was reading through the book of Romans the other day and I stumbled across another name that I thought was interesting. Uh, Romans, the last chapter, Romans 16, where Paul's naming all the people that are at Rome. And it's curious, the Apostle Peter is not listed there. That's because he never went to Rome. Okay, For those of us who are Bible readers, we know that Peter was not permitted to go to Rome. He's the Apostle of the Jews. He went north and east and ended up in Babylon, uh, taking care of the uh, scattered Jews, the diaspora that was in Babylon. Uh, Paul went to the west. He's the Apostle of the Gentiles. And in his uh, uh, listing of people that are at Rome, one of the people he lists in uh, verse 15, he says, Salute! Philologus. Philologus. I like that's another great uh, word there. Now, philo, as we know, is love. And logos is the word. Amen. And so, Theophilus is someone that loves God, and Philologus is someone who loves the word of God. Mm. And so, those are two good names. Those who can surname ourselves, uh, Theophilus Philologus. <laughs> and um, I don't know who would get that, but we would get it, and, and that's who he's writing this to. Now, he says here, in, back in his introduction of the Acts of the Apostles, speaking about the former treatise was about all that Jesus began both to do and to teach. The Gospel of Luke is, a, is of all the Gospels, the most intellectual. It has the most parables in there. A lot of Jesus' teachings are in the Gospel of Luke. Things that he did as he performed his three-year ministry and the teachings that he gave. And it goes all the way up, verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up the day in which he was taken up. Now, you'll see this word uh, phrase repeated in verse 9. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up. And this is referring to the ascension of Jesus Christ. After he was resurrected, he spends 40 days with his disciples, and then he is taken up. He is 
carried up is the word that Luke uses. Go back to uh, Luke chapter 24. It's referred to three, ra- three ways in the Scripture. Taken up, carried up, caught up. Those are the three ways that ascension is mentioned in the Scriptures. Taken up in Acts, carried up in Luke chapter 24. Getting toward the end of that particular Gospel, picking it up in verse um, 50. And as he led them out, as far as to Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass... While he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. So the taking up, the process of being taken up, the process of being uh, carried up, the act of being caught up, First Thessalonians chapter 4, 17, that's going to happen to us. See, what Jesus did and what Jesus performed... In, in, in the resurrecting of Himself through the power of God the Father Himself and the Holy Spirit and giving Himself a glorified resurrected body, He's going to do the same to those that follow Him. And so He was carried up, He was taken up, and one day you and I will be caught up and we will ascend and we will leave this planet and we will leave this robe of flesh behind and we will go up in a glorified body. And so Luke is showing this here. This is Jesus Christ being carried up, being taken up. Now it was interesting the uh, carried up and, and taken up are the connections between the two epistles. And I, and I have in my hands here um, a Greek uh, called the New Testament in Greek by a couple of men named Westcott and Hort. Now these, these are, are modern uh, revivers, this Westcott and Hort characters in the 1800s they lived. And these were people that uh, decided to uh, corrupt and pervert the Word of God. Now, they really didn't do that. Paul mentions in his epistles, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17, that even while Paul was here, there were people corrupting the Word of God. And then Paul goes on and tells the Thessalonian church in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, that there were people writing forged epistles at the time of Paul. So corruptions and perversions and forgeries of the Word of God goes on all the time. The devil, the first thing he did when he came on the scene, yea, hath God said, he likes to corrupt, pervert, alter, forge, counterfeit, and put cast doubt on the Word of God. This is, this is his M.O. He hasn't changed. We know this because we have a Bible. Now, this was going on in, in Paul's time. This has gone on from time immemorial all the way back to the garden. These guys revived this practice and uh, in the 1800s. And uh, I guess a sleeping church at that time permitted them to do it. And they, they rewrote uh, Luke's Gospel. And it's very interesting in this particular verse. Uh, as he was parted from them, they put a period. And they removed the phrase, and carried up into heaven. There's a parenthesis around it as they're removing the phrase right here in verse 51 in this corrupt Greek manuscript that they have here. And so, now you, you, what you do is you cut the, the golden ring that just like they would attach the, the breastplate to the ephod back in the priest, they had these golden rings. Well, God has golden rings that attach parts of Scriptures. Yeah. He has a golden thread that weaves its way through Scripture. And, and these perverters and corruptors of the Word of God snip it. And so, a lot of your modern Bibles come from this, and you read the, uh, some of the newer versions that come from these Greek, Greek manuscripts. I guess the, the major one that comes from this is something called the New American Standard Bible, the NASB, written in 1960 by the Lachman Foundation. They're the major followers of this corrupt Greek manuscript by Westcott and Hort, as they cut this little phrase out. Another phrase they cut out is in the very next verse, 52. It says, He was carried up into heaven and they worshipped him. They removed that phrase. They don't like worship to the Lord Jesus Christ, because that's, that's the devil. He doesn't want Jesus to be worshipped, and he doesn't like the thought that he was carried up to heaven. He likes the thought that he parted from them, and maybe as a man went off into India and got a wife and had kids. Yeah, These are the kind yeah. of things. And when you cut little like, things like this out of the Bible, which is out of this Westcott and Hort manuscript, and out of the New American Standard Bible, and the uh, Revised Version, and the Revised Standard Version, you miss a lot of good things. So we won't follow them. I just bring them up for your attention. And by the way, God, God's wise to these guys. He warns them in Revelation. You know, at the time they were corrupting this thing, the early revisers corrupting at the time of Apostle Paul, Revelation uh, chapter 22, verse 19 hadn't been written yet, which warns them, if any man take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city. 
And so Westcott and Hort, I have a feeling where they are right now and these revisers. But we're going to follow the Acts of the Apostle and the Gospel of Luke as in our Holy King James Bible and in the Received Text. And so I just uh, point these things out to you. It's good. It's good to have God's Word. God is faithful. He's given us His Son, the Word with a capital W. He's given us a Bible, the Word with a little w, the Holy Authorized Version of the Bible, the King James Bible. That's what we're studying. And in the introduction, we see that it has to do with until the time Jesus ascended, that's as far as the first treatise went. But now this second treatise here is going to pick up at the time of the ascension and go forward and see the acts of the apostles. And it's going to begin with the instruction of the very first apostle. The very first apostle. Who might that be? Go to Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 1. Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider, look at this, the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. Do you see that? The acts of the apostles will begin with a little bit of instruction by way of introduction and the final act of the first apostle, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. There He is in Scripture. I don't have time to go into that now, but if you follow us on our, on our uh, studies on Thursday night, I will show you the difference between how Jesus manifested Himself in the New Testament as an apostle and the manifestation of Himself in the Old Testament, which is in Exodus chapter 23 and in verse 20, Behold, I send an angel with a capital A before thee. The old appearances in the Old Testament were angelic appearances of Jesus. The New Testament appearance was one where He took on flesh as an apostle and then was resurrected. And so, the Acts of the Apostles will begin with the instruction and the first act of the Apostle and High Priest of our faith. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, going back to where we were in the book of Acts. Introduction, verse 1 and 2. Now, verses 3 through 8... We're going to see instruction. The introduction of Luke, the instruction of our Lord. All right. Apostles whom he had chosen, verse 3, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. There's a lot of good words in this particular verse we just looked at. We'll take them one by one. To whom also He showed Himself alive after His passion. The Lord Jesus Christ, this is the only time in the Scriptures you'll find the word passion. It's right here in Acts 1.3. This is why you'll hear some of them talk about the Passion Week. Passion is a feeling of the mind. Passion is a zeal. Jesus spoke of the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Passion is a desire. Okay? Uh, Jesus said, with desire, I have desire to eat this Passover meal with you. He said in the Last Supper. Uh, it's a love and a suffering. This is what Jesus went through on our behalf. He considered the joy that was before us. He endured the cross. Because the joy was knowing that He could bring many sons to glory. That He could give us the power to become the sons of God only if He went through that passion. Without the passion, no new birth. Very important. The death, burial, and resurrection, the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ was the suffering and the love and the desire and the zeal that He went through in, in order that you and I could be saved. The, His teaching could not save us. His birth could not save us. The miracles He performed for three and a half years could not save us. But the passion and the death, burial, and resurrection was what was needed for salvation. And therefore, of it being so important to show Himself alive after that passion, to, to, to come back from the dead, to rise from the dead, to be risen, to have a glorified body, He says, by many infallible proofs showed Himself. By many infallible 
fallible, a great word, again, a Bible word found right here, the one time, right here, connected with the, the appearance of the resurrected Jesus Christ. That's infallible. That is not capable of having error. I hear a lot of people talk, you know, the plenary, inspired, infallible. I hear this all the time from Christian scholars who don't believe a Bible. Because I ask them, well, if you believe all that, where's the Bible? Well, there is no Bible. There's lots of copies and lots of versions of it. Well, then why do you use all those fancy words? Look, let's use Bible words and let's believe the book. The infallible, not capable of having error, entirely free of mistake or error, infallible certainty that we have is the certainty of the resurrection, the certainty that he demonstrated that resurrection, and the certainty that he continues to communicate that through the word of God that he's given to us. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Somebody just asked me the other day, how do you know there's a God? I said, because there's a Bible. That's how you know there's a God. So, well, why do you say that? I said, because if you look at this Bible, the first thing you'll find in this authorized version of a King James Holy Bible is there are no contradictions. It is perfectly woven together. I have read it through 35 times from Genesis verse 1 to the end, last verse in Revelation 22, and there are no contradictions in it. The words are pure. And another thing, there's history in it. And every time anyone tries to verify the history, it's accurate and verifiable. It has no historical mistakes. And another thing, it has prophecy. I took him to Isaiah. I showed him the prophecy of Cyrus. I said, here is a prophecy of a man. He names the man Cyrus, says this man will be a king and this man will let my people go. And a hundred and something years later, the man is born, becomes king and lets the Jewish people go. I said, it has accurate prophecy in it. So it has no contradictions, no errors. It doesn't change. I said, all these books in my library are changing. They update them. They have new editions of them. This book doesn't. That's how you know there's a God. And secondarily, if you're not sure, I said the Jewish people. Numbers 23, they shall not be reckoned among the nations. No matter where the Jewish people have been, they've always stayed Jewish. And that's another work of God. So you've got two things. And you know there's a God. Most importantly, the Bible. And the Word of God, which testifies to Jesus Christ. And when Jesus begins his instruction, after showing himself for 40 days, notice what he speaks about. He speaks, and to verse 3, of things pertaining to the kingdom of, notice, God. The kingdom of God. Now, in the Acts of the Apostles, I told you it is a transitional book. It is an historical book. And there is going to be a transitional shift occurring in this book. And we're going to see it. We'll come to the key verse in a little bit. Jesus will give us the key verse of the book that will divide this book for us. But there will be a transition occurring. And the transition is going to be from what Jesus and John announced back in Matthew. Go back to Matthew chapter 3. At the end of the Old Testament, at the very beginning, in the very first book of your New Testament, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes on the scene and before Him, His forerunner shows up, this is what they preach. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. In those days came John the Baptist, the forerunner, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And when Jesus begins His preaching in the next chapter, chapter 4, Verse 17, And from that time Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The offer was the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of God. The offer to the Jewish people was the kingdom of heaven. Now, Acts is going to be a transitional book, and Jesus is going to transition to teach them about the kingdom of God because that's what's going to go forward, not the kingdom of heaven. And you'll see the confusion in the disciples. They're going to ask him later on in this chapter, hey, what about the kingdom in Israel? And he says, no, no, this is not it now. It's the kingdom of God. We're making a shift. Now, let me just give you an idea on the board, give you a thought. There are three kingdoms mentioned in the Bible. There are the kingdoms of the world. And right now, they're in the hand of the wicked one, and he's the prince of the power of the air. He's the God with a little g of this world. In the beginning, God made the heaven and the earth. And, and around planet earth, i got a better blue one here. I better find it. Is heaven, and this is the kingdom, well, wrong color. Whatever, we'll take it. Of heaven, purple. 
And of course, in the heaven of heavens, way out there somewhere, God exists and God is in eternity. And out here is the kingdom of God. And if you want to look at it spatially and in time from a temporal chronological standpoint, coming out of eternity, sweeping out of eternity, God begins the kingdom of God and starts the kingdom of heaven in the garden where heaven and earth are together and God's walking with men. And very quickly, they mess it up and we begin the kingdoms of the world. And we're living in the times of the kingdoms of the world. And God's desire then was to restore the kingdom of heaven with Israel being the head of nations and the kingdom of heaven right there in the Holy Land. And when they rejected God's Son and said, we will not have this man to be king over us, then God withdrew the offer and now He's starting something called the kingdom of God. And it's a spiritual thing working inside. Now He will come back and give Him what they promised for a thousand year millennial reign. But when that ends, we'll, step, we'll go back into eternity. Eternity will go back into the kingdom of God. But He's going to begin working on the kingdom of God and that's what He's teaching these men, not the kingdom of heaven. So it's uh, helpful, good for us to try and understand to discern those little differences. They're not the same thing. How do I know that? Let's see. God is a different word than heaven. See? So they're two different words. See? God is not heaven. Heaven is not God. They're, one is a person. One is a place. So they're two different things. I know they're commonly mistaught as being the same thing, but they're not. And Jesus is trying to teach them this right here in Acts. But the confusion uh, con continues to this day. Because sometimes we don't rightly divide the word. So he's going to begin teaching and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. This is going to be the instruction is going to be about the kingdom of God. So let's see what he has to say about it. Verse uh, 4. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not, uh, they should not depart from Jerusalem, but... And then it says words of red. Here he is instructing. If you have a red letter edition, here's the words of Jesus Christ in red. It starts in a red word. Wait for the promise of the Father, which, and then black saith he, red again, ye have heard of me. So Jesus speaks here. Uh, wait, this is him speaking in red. Wait for the promise of the Father, which ye have heard of me. Those are the words of Jesus in red. Those are his instructions that he's giving to the men. Again, that's messed up in Westcott and Hort's edition. They cut some of Jesus' words out. But, but we're going to stay with the authorized version. And here's Jesus speaking. Very important. The first word he gives to the men, he says, wait. Wait. Why? Folks, we tend to be in a hurry. You know, we run to and fro, knowledge increases. That's just our nature. We want things to get done yesterday. I tend to be like that. That's our natural man. But wait, God's on a different timetable. God doesn't move as quickly as we want. And, and so he says, wait, wait. Psalm 37, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Wait patiently. No matter what you're going through, just wait on the Lord. And we, we know it as a little church. And we wait and we wait, Lord. But let's just be patient. What will we do in the meantime? We'll occupy ourselves with the Word of God and the ministry of God. We'll occupy ourselves with prayer. Occupy ourselves with worship. Occupy ourselves with witnessing. Occupy ourselves with helping our, our, our missionaries. And wait. And we'll wait. Wait. For the promise of the Father, I have that underlined in red, the promise of the Father, words of red. Again, connecting us back to Luke chapter 24. The golden thread, the golden links that hold these books together. Luke 24, verse 49. Jesus' resurrection, post-resurrection appearance in this 40-day period. He says, And behold, I send the promise of My Father upon you. Tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. The promise of the Father. The promise of My Father. Wait. Wait for that. What is that? Go to John. Next book. Chapter 14. Uh, John 14. 
Verse 16, And I will pray the Father, and He shall give you another Comforter, that He may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. So the promise that, that Jesus is giving to these men on the Last Supper here, and then after His resurrection in Luke, and then after His resurrection in Acts, is the promise of the Father is that of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says right here, whom the world cannot receive, but He's going to abide with you forever. Isn't that, isn't that precious? Isn't that precious? Your spirit will be linked to the Holy Spirit. And what God hath joined together, no man can put asunder. So how, how good is your salvation? Why, it's eternal. It's forever. You have an assurance of an eternal salvation if you have waited and allowed God's Holy Spirit to link up with your spirit. That's God's promise. You know, it's impossible for God to lie. And so when God makes a promise, He cannot break His promises. The promises of God are yea and amen. What a blessing. What a blessing. The promise of the Father. And so back to where we were in Acts. He'll also confirm it right there. Verse 4, Wait for the promise of the Father which ye have heard of me. Verse 5, For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Again, the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, the Lord's going to help us to understand these things. We're growing up as Christians. We're going beyond the basics. So let's grow from children a little more in our faith and get into some of the deeper things. This baptism of the Holy Spirit that they're waiting for obviously is a little different than what happened in John chapter 20. Turn back to John chapter 20. John chapter 20, we know, is where Christ is portrayed here. The portrait is Him as the conqueror of death. This is the resurrection of Sunday morning, what we call Easter, but it's resurrection day. And, and this is the first day of the week when Mary, the Magdalene come, Mary Magdalene comes early and Jesus appears. Now notice what happens later on in this chapter, verse 19. The same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. What a blessing. What a blessing. And that's our Lord Jesus is the Prince of Peace. If you don't have any peace in your life, you need to let Him come to you and bring peace to you. That's, that's the only hope you have. Uh, glory to God in the highest. Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men. It's the goodwill that God gives in the person of His Son, Jesus Christ. That's God's goodwill. You know, it's not some old shoes and an old coat. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's God's goodwill. And it comes in the person of His Son. And when you give glory to God for that, He'll send His Son and you'll have peace in your heart. Peace be unto you. And then He says in verse 22, And when He had said this, uh, He breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, here's what happened. The Lord Jesus Christ could not give the Holy Ghost to anyone until He was resurrected, until He was glorified. Now here He's re resurrected. Now He's glorified. It's the very first day. He's meeting with His disciples. And what He does is He imparts the Holy Ghost unto them. This is the impartation of the Holy Ghost. He, they're receiving the Holy Ghost. This is John 22. I'm going to have to do some uh, drawing up here to, to show a little bit. So we'll mark this on the board. We're looking at John 22. And verse 22. And here he says, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. These men in this upper room were believers on the Lord Jesus Christ and this was the day they received the new birth. Right there. Resurrection Sunday. This is the equivalent of turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And this is going to be different than what they are waiting for in Acts chapter 2, which is 50 days later. Ephesians chapter 1. Looking at uh, verse 12, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. 
I mean, if, if, if we've taken the time at one point in our life to trust in Jesus Christ, then God wants to change us into the praise of His glory. We first trusted in Christ. Verse 13, in whom ye also trusted. So speaking to those of us here in this room that have trusted in Christ. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Somebody brought the gospel of salvation to you. Somebody brought the word to you. How do you get born again? Faith cometh by hearing, hearing by the word of God. People are born again by hearing the gospel of salvation. They're not born again by hearing a reading from the Gospels. That's not going to save them. Okay? The four Gospels, birth and the teaching and miracle ministry of Jesus Christ. The Gospel of your salvation is the death, burial, and resurrection and the fact that you as a sinner must call upon the Lord in order to be saved. And if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the risen Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart in your heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That's the gospel of your salvation. That's the word of truth. Now notice what happens in verse 13. When you trust, when you hear that word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, watch what happens, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Receive ye the Holy Ghost. The moment you and I believe the gospel, the moment you and I believe what God has said about His Son, faith is not believing God. Faith is believing what God has written and what God has said. And the word of truth is about the person of truth. In the Scriptures is not eternal life, but they testify of Jesus Christ who is the resurrection and the life. And when somebody believes that, at that moment... God seals them with the Holy Spirit and they receive the Holy Ghost. That's what's happening here to the men in the upper room. That's what's happening here in Ephesians 1 and verse 13. That's what's happening here. And that is what is being spoken of in turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. First Corinthians chapter 12. And I'm laying this groundwork so you can see that what's going to happen in Acts 2 is not this. It's something different. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, he's talking about the body of Christ here. And, he, and he's saying about the body, verse 12, 12, 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many, are one body, so also is Christ. So he's saying, let's take a look at a human body. And the human body has lots of members. Got a finger, got a toe, got a knee, got a shoulder. And yet, they're members, but this is still one body with different members. So also is Christ. Let's go from the earthly to the heavenly. Let's take a Jesus Christ. The body of Christ has many different members. Christ is the head, and those of us are different members. Verse 13, For by one Spirit, are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, whether we have all been made to drink into one spirit, for the body is not one member, but many. Now that is this. 1 Corinthians twelve, thirteen. When you hear the word of truth, when you hear the gospel of salvation, and in your heart and in your spirit, you bow the knee to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, as a sinner, then in that moment, what happens is the Holy Spirit baptizes you into the body of Christ and you become a member of the true church, the body of Christ, the spiritual nation which Jesus Christ is putting together, which He is building right here on planet Earth. Okay? That's that. That's the sealing of the Spirit. That's the baptizing of the Spirit into Christ. Okay? Receiving the Holy Ghost is to be sealed. It's to be baptized. Watch it now carefully. Baptized by... I'm getting dyslexic. By the Spirit. By the Spirit into the body of Christ. That's the one baptism you need. That's the one baptism you need. This is another baptism that's going to happen here in Acts chapter 1. Uh, you don't necessarily need it on planet Earth. And I would dare to say from my experience in talking, most Christians never get it. 
the one that will finally come in Acts chapter 2. Oh, you will get it when you get your glorified body, believe me. But you, most Christians will never get this baptism down here. Uh, sad to say, and we'll talk about this, but I want to show the difference between the receiving of the Holy Ghost, being sealed, and being baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. What he's talking about here is different. This is a promise of the Father given by the Son. This is the baptism of the Holy Spirit by the Son. Not the baptism by the Spirit into the body, but the baptism of the Son, of the Spirit by the Son. Different thing. Let me go. Now, I'm going to teach you. Go back to Matthew chapter 3. This is a different baptism. And again, my observation, most Christians will not get this during their lifetime. Sad, but true. As the, the devil is a tremendous adversary and has done a tremendous job in confusing mainly the Word of God. And one of the reasons you're going to get it is by knowing which Bible is God's. And that's uh, very rarely happens. Uh, Matthew chapter 3. John the Baptist comes. He's preaching the kingdom of heaven. And he says this, um, verse 10, And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is you and down cast into the fire. I indeed baptize you with water under repentance. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He, that's the Son, shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And that's all you need to go. There's a comma and then another phrase, and fire. Okay, But Jesus Christ... This is not being baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. What we're talking about here in the book of Acts, putting a division between it, what we have going on over here in Acts, it's, it's instructed in Acts 1, it will be given in Acts chapter 2, is going to be a promise of the Father. Let's see if I get a different color here. here. This will be a promise of the Father. It will be a baptism by the Son giving the Holy Ghost. Baptism by the Son. This is a baptism by the Spirit into Christ. This is a baptism by the Son giving the Holy Ghost. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Every one of you will get this. Every Christian will get this the day he gets his glorified body. So if you never got it during your life, and most Christians won't, <laughs> but you will get it. Believe me, Jesus Christ will do it. He's going to do both parts of this verse. He's going to baptize Christians with the Holy Ghost, and he's going to baptize unbelievers with fire. The fire is judgment. Okay, verse 12. Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge the floor. He will gather the wheat into the garner. He can baptize them with the Holy Ghost, bring them to heaven. But he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. That's the baptism of fire. Uh, Revelation chapter uh, 20, uh, verse uh, 19, as they get thrown into the lake of fire. That's the baptism of fire of judgment. Okay, that's a different baptism there. So this is, this is Jesus Christ is, is teaching them about a promise that's going to come. This is uh, also reiterated in Mark chapter 1, verse 8, Luke chapter 3, verse 16, uh, John chapter 1, verse uh, 33. And you'll notice when Jesus himself reiterates what uh, John the Baptist promises about this baptism with the Holy Ghost, and, and, and John the Baptist did say, comma, and with fire, when Jesus talks about it, he says, ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost, verse 5, he doesn't add, and fire. Because Jesus Christ does not baptize his children with fire. That's judgment for unbelievers. Okay? He's not, none of us are going to get baptized with fire. Baptism, we're going to find out here, is, is immersion. It's, it's being dipped in something. We're not going to be dipped into a lake of fire. We will be dipped into the Holy Ghost when we get our glorified body. And some people will get it. Now, this is, this is what's happened. Here you're sealed. This is a baptism of immersion and a filling and an overflowing that you would find in Ephesians 5. As opposed to a sealing, this is a baptism of, of incredible filling. Overfilling. My cup runneth over. 
ideally, it doesn't for most of us, but, but ideally, very few of us will ever attain unto what God would have us to be down here. And, and I think part of the reason is we're just in the Laodicean church age. I mean, I think God understands we're flesh and He understands the times we're in and He's merciful and He's saving a lot of people. But He understands most of us will never attain to what He would have us to. I'm not saying it can't be done. It could be. I mean, if you have a heart for it and you want to know the Word of God and you want to love God's Word and you'll figure out which Bible is His and you'll read all of Scripture from beginning to end and let it start to fill you, this may happen. But, but anyways, <laughs> Ephesians 5, verse 17 uh, wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. The will of the Lord is first you get saved. Okay, uh, Timothy chapter four or chapter two, verse four. Also, that you come to a knowledge of the truth, the authorized version, and then Timothy, Second uh, Timothy three sixteen seventeen, and you read all of Scripture. Willing, uh, be not drunk with wine, verse eighteen. Where is excess? But be Filled with the Spirit. This is the kind of filling and baptism they're going to be seeing in Acts two. Now. As we read through the book of Acts, we will see that this baptism occurs on these men over and over. They will be filled with it in in chapter 2, chapter 4, verse 8, chapter 4, verse 31, chapter 9, verse 17, chapter 13, verse 9. This will happen again and again and again. Why? Because God would like us to stay filled. God would like us to pull up to the pump and fill up on a daily basis. So much so that we're kind of overflowing. He doesn't mind when we overflow. Why? Because the excess will spill onto others around us. He says the Holy Ghost will come upon you. It'll come upon you because you've filled up so much it's bubbling over you now. And that's the type of baptism we're going to be looking at in the book of Acts. So going back to where we were in Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Wait for the promise of the Father, which ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. And, uh, and what I'm saying to you is that that water could never wash away sins. And it never can. And baptism with water is insufficient. It's a picture of something much greater to happen. And so that's why people need the Holy Ghost. They need to be baptized into the body of Christ by the Spirit. They need to be sealed with the Spirit They need to receive the Holy Ghost. They must place their faith in Jesus Christ. And then he says here, Ye shall be baptized with water, or with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. So so it was very nice for the Lord to just tell them, you're going to have to wait, but it won't be a long time. It's not going to be a long time. Now we know when this happens, because this is going to follow the festivals of the nation Israel. And Jesus Christ was the Passover lamb. And he resurrected on Resurrection Sunday. And then they mark seven times seven after that. So that's 49 days. And then one day after that is the Pentecost. And this is going to happen on Pentecost. So right now here, they're at the 40th day. They're at day 40. So it's going to happen on day 50. It's not many days. It's going to be 10 days. That's all it's going to be. It's going to be a short time. I don't know if they put that all together. I don't know if they were thinking they were thinking about other things at the time, but it's following the festivals of Israel. God gave the oracles of uh, God unto the Jews, and they're a pattern. The tabernacle is a pattern. The festivals are a pattern. They're the pattern for prophecy and for the history that God's going to write. And so he lays this out. It won't be many days hence. Verse 6. So how do they respond? When they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Well, you know, this kingdom of God stuff sounds esoteric and spiritual. And what about the kingdom of Israel? I mean, after all, we're Jews. You're a Jew. This is the nation of Israel. Will you at this time restore the the, the, the nation, the kingdom to the nation. That's what we want. After all, there's a lot of reasons we want it. For example, you promised us back in Matthew chapter 19, they were together at one point and they were talking, and uh, in Matthew chapter 19, uh, Peter said to him in, in 1927, he was talking about, I guess what happened was the uh, rich young ruler had just come to him, and, and the rich young ruler asked him some things, and he said, there's nobody good except God. He says, if you really want to know God, you need to follow me. So Jesus is forcing this man and, 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 and saying, you're going to have to make a choice between the world or following me. And the rich young ruler, really, I can't leave everything I have. I have these earthly possessions. I'm not going to do that. So he went away. And then Peter says to him, 
verse 27, then Peter said, well, well, Behold, we've forsaken all and have followed thee. What shall we have therefore? And we gave up everything. My wife is still back there in Capernaum, you know, with her mother, and it's good to be away from mother-in-law for a while. And then, but you know, I mean, I'm following you, and I gave up the house there, and uh, I'm following you. What, what do we get? Verse 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of His glory, ye also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Hey Lord, I remember that. Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? I'm ready for that throne. I understand. I understand their desire. Okay? They have a promise made to them. Now, you know God's going to keep the promise, but not at this time. Not at this time. Now, they probably read through, go to Psalm 102. You know, these were good Jewish boys. They had gone to synagogue. And they had a heart for God. Because when God's Son showed up, they, they, they could put it together. Wow. This, this is the one that the Scriptures have spoken of. The Messiah. Jesus of Nazareth. And so, they, they, here's, they're reading through Psalm 102 one day. And they're reading David's prayer. And they're reading, and they, they read this um, in verse 16. When the Lord shall build up Zion, He shall appear in His glory. I mean, here he's going to build the kingdom of Israel. He's going to build up Zion. He's going to appear in His glory. He's going to do that. I mean, they're waiting for the Lord to appear. And now they're standing there with Jesus Christ resurrected in His glorified body. And they're thinking, well, the verse says right here, when the Lord shall build up Zion, He shall appear in His glory. Are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel now? Now notice, they're misreading the verse. You've got to look carefully. They're almost reading it, when He shall appear in His glory, the Lord shall build up Zion. That's not what it says. It says, when the Lord shall build up Zion, He shall appear in His glory. Okay? And believe me, when He does build up Zion and He does restore the kingdom, He'll be there in His glory. But He didn't have to do it right there and right then. Why? Because the work... Listen, I know this verse has been misquoted to you a lot. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. But that's, they're misquoting that verse. Turn to Hebrews. I want to show you how that verse is misquoted to people and mistaught. Hebrews chapter 13. When Jesus Christ condescends unto us and moves from the eternal into the spatial and the temporal and enters our universe, He works within the confines of time. And He does different things at different times. So this particular verse, verse Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever, that's always quoted out of context and taught like, well, He did miracles back then, He's doing them now. He's doing the miracle of the new birth now. Okay? He's not restoring withered hands now. And, and I want to show you what the problem with that is. Verse, it's, it's following verse 7. Look at verse 7. Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. What's the end of their conversation? Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. A good preacher will give preeminence to Jesus Christ. The end of every, of every one of his messages will be to point you to Jesus Christ. Whether he speaks yesterday, today, or tomorrow, no matter what that guy speaks and when he speaks, he ought to lead you to Jesus Christ. Yesterday, today, or tomorrow. If he doesn't, then you don't need to follow him. He, doesn't, he hasn't spoken on you the Word of God properly. That's the end of his conversation. Jesus Christ. We preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus and Him crucified. Folks, are we growing up? Are we starting to get these things? Are we going to let bad teachers confuse us? If we just read things in context, we'll understand them. So are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? No. When it's time for me to build up Zion, I will be in my glory, but it doesn't mean every time I show up in my glory, I'm going to build up Zion. Let me determine the times and the seasons. My father and I will determine the times and the seasons. Let's go back uh, to where we were in Acts chapter 1. We must be running out of time. Joey, how are we doing? Let's wind it down. All right. And he said unto them, verse 7, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. It is not for you. Now look at carefully. To whom is he speaking? 
This is the acts of the apostles. Okay? The apostles would not know the times or the seasons or the day of the coming of the return of the Lord and setting up the kingdom of Israel. In all the prophecy they were given, they desired to look into those things and could not understand them. They wrote them faithfully down. Paul kept saying he would hope that he would attain unto the resurrection. Or in the last days, it could happen any day. And yet he wrote these things faithfully down that you and I, carefully going through the Scriptures and putting things down together carefully, are understanding that see, it had to be a couple thousand years after that resurrection. And God gives progressive revelation unto us. But those Jewish men, they were Jewish apostles. The Jews will not know the time of the Lord's return. They will not know the time. When they're in the midst of the tribulation, they will not know. Even though Jews in the midst of the tribulation will know the day all those folks disappeared from planet Earth. They'll go, well, yeah, what, what was in the newspapers? As a matter of fact, let me pull it up here on my little, uh, uh, what do they carry, phones now? These phones, they carry phones, do they? That, that you know, the phone and the, the internet. Look at that. Millions disappear from planet. Bloody clothes found everywhere. Cribs stained with infant clothes and, and infants missing. It happened on such and such a day. Such, they'll all know that and they won't know the day he's coming back. He will not let the Jews know. It's not for them to know. It, it has to do with the return of the Lord, not the rapture. Okay, That's what he's pointing to. We're going to have to end for today. We'll, we'll have a lot more to say next week. Any questions on what we said today so far? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sister. Uh, yes, it, it is. Uh, we will chapter two. We will continue on that. Okay, chapter two it will occur, and chapter two we will explain it. Um, no, you are baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. That, that's what it said. You were sealed with the Spirit. You received the Holy Spirit. Baptized into the body of Christ with a sealing and a receiving. Isn't there a difference being baptized with it? As um, this will be giving the Holy Spirit a baptism by the Son, a promise of the Father. And we will read it in chapter 2 and we'll see what happened and we'll, we'll tie it together and it'll, it'll make more sense. I'm just showing you there is a difference. There, there is a difference. I certainly hope you know. And there is. And anyways, we'll continue to go on and meditate on these things. And it's, it, it may, may not be for you now to know these things. It takes a, a lot of meditation on the Word of God to understand these deeper truths. Amen. All you need to know is a simple one. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Thou shalt be saved. At that moment, you will be sealed. You'll be baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. And even if you don't get this stuff now, we'll all get it in your glorified body. Then you'll know in full. Thank you, Father, for the teaching of the Word of God. I, I know it's deep. Please help us to... Uh, we're in deep waters now. Help us to understand these things. But thank you for the simplicity of salvation that even a child can get it. And except we become as children, we cannot be converted and enter the kingdom of heaven. Help us in childlike faith to believe what you've said about your Son. He is the Savior. We are sinners. We desperately need His grace and mercy. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.